You are listening to World Have Your Say. We're live at the Youth Assembly, uh, Civicus in Montreal. And if you'd like to get in touch, you can go to our blog at worldhaveyoursay.com or maybe you'd like to send us a text that is country code plus four four seventy seven eighty six twenty sixty eighty or give us a call, country code plus four four twenty seventy eighty three seventy two seventy two. And we have a little comment. Yes, I am Ashani from Jamaica. I, I just totally agree with, with Bert because I think there's a difference between giving someone in li life imprisonment and giving them and compassionate leave because giving them life imprisonment is, is compassionate because he, they, he killed over 200 people. So I, I, I think he, he, he should not be um, let out. He should, have, he should have remained in prison and until he died because we have given him enough compassionate by keep keeping him alive. So. Now, Ashani, some comments have come in to you as well from our blog. Do you want to read a little bit of that and see if they agree with you? Well, this is, this is from Roy from Washington, posted on the World Have You Say blog. He said the victims of this bombing didn't receive any compassion, so neither should he have received any. You deserve as much compassion as you show your victims. So definitely, he's agreeing with what I'm saying. Okay, so who else you got there? Well, I, I have Michael here also, but he, I'm not so sure where he's from, but he said, even if he were repent, repentant, what he did was to commit an act of such pure evil that he himself chose to wash away any reason to give him compassion. So definitely you see that people are agreeing with what I'm saying, because definitely I don't think he deserves any passion of leave to come out of prison. I think he should have remained in prison until he died. And he, he's still living three months after he was supposed to die, so he's still in prison. So we have John Collins, who's the director of the Criminal Justice Alliance, also joining us. Bert Ammerman, Lockerbie, uh, relative, his brother Tommy had died of the Pan Am flight. Uh, he is outside of this room. We have about 50 people in this room. John Collins, we're going to bring you in now. You've heard a little from people in the room and outside of the room. What's your opinion? Well, I think the first thing that's important to remember is that we don't have a death penalty here in the UK. So the sentence that this individual received was the harshest sentence that was available to the courts at the time. Um, also, somebody mentioned that um, an argument that a prison wasn't a good place to live your life home or to die. But I feel very hard for the families because I don't feel that an airplane is a good place to die either. So it brings in very difficult questions. Well, let, let's put that back to John. John, what would you say to uh, Amelia who is saying that an airplane is not a good place to die either? Of course it isn't, and I don't want to sort of minimise the, uh, the hurt or harm that's done to the families of the victims of this very unusual and extremely serious crime, but I don't think that the criminal justice system should resort to a sort of eye for an eye approach to, to go to the level of the person who committed the crime. Has anybody here ever been a victim of a crime? Doesn't matter how small. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's a lot. Um, my name is Isaac and I'm from Kenya. Um, the, um, the thing that I would like to talk about is um, the post violence ele uh, election violence that we had in Kenya well, in 2007. So Isaac, tell me who committed a crime against you. Uh, the, it, it, um, we had the elections and then we had violence and as a, as a person, as a citizen who is active, I did vote for my, the person that I wanted to become the president, but then that didn't happen. And so what happened after that? was a lot of chaos and lots of people died and lots of property was destroyed and everything just was in chaos and I was in that country and I couldn't move, I couldn't go anywhere for at least a month. I was just grounded. And I, if that was a crime that was committed to me and to the other Kenyans, to the other people who love their country and who had voted, but that still does and still we haven't had justice. I mean it's from Canada. I suggested that we ask a question. What's stopping young people engaging with the global issues? There seems to be a disconnect between our actions and our informed principles. We want to explore why. Yoko from Geneva says, the production chain has become so long that as consumers, we are completely disconnected from the producer. Being disconnected makes it hard to care. I'm Mr. from Canada. For me, it comes down to pleasure. Buying at giant mega stores costs less money, leaving you more money to have fun. Eating vegetarian takes a bit more effort and often is less enjoyable than biting into a big juicy steak. My <laughs> initial interest in this question was actually because um, today's youth are more aware um, and, and, well, they're more aware than any generation before us. Because of access to the internet and other um, print media and other things, we know what's going on in the world more than ever before. Um, and not only are, are we aware, but we actually, 
we're principled as well. We have um, there's there's general consensus that you know child labor is not good, um, environmentally destructive practices are not good, and we're aware of this. And and uh, we have principles. And yet, as youth, we continue to engage in behavior that is um, in direct contradiction with these principles. Okay. It may be in Kansas to think that it can't only be on one segment to the population to change and inhabit. Parents need to set an example for their children, and the youth need to be prepared to set an example for future generations. And I think that's the good I, I want to pick up on that point, because that was something I was just thinking about when we were um, talking about this before the show started. Did you learn your consumer or ethical habits from your parents, or do they differ? Um, so my parents are immigrants, and um, I guess from... Where are your parents from, Cindy? From Vietnam. Okay. So I was born in the U.S. Uh-huh. And so, I guess growing up for them, um, when they settled in the U.S., their um, shopping habits and lifestyle were drastically different from what they are now. And so, in terms of food, for instance, um, maybe they won't splurge on the extra, you know, like salmon or things like that. Or, um, but now I can always buy things that I want to eat. Both India and South Africa have a rising middle class, I would say. Uh, people who have not really had the opportunity before to experience certain luxuries, uh, you know, simple things like what we assume are, you know, uh, for granted, like owning a car or going on a holiday. Uh, people are experiencing that for the first time in this generation. So, uh, you know, what do we tell them about consumerism, you know, uh, because uh, they're just learning about something. I think they're from a media perspective with the profusion of television, which is like really very big in India. Uh, you know, people are compelled to, you know, spend and to take up things because they just want to, you know, uh, do what everybody else is doing. Just in terms of social, like, fair trade goods, for example, the more we demand it, the more producers will get involved to produce it and the more, it'll, the more available it will be at a lower cost. I think I'll be a bit different from uh, what, the what the discussions are based on the question that is posed our responsibility. I think what, what, that is one of the reasons why we are here at Simcos. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier at the beginning of the session that young people need to take responsibilities on their own shoulders to make sure the changes that you want to see, let them be themselves. One way that we can do that, we have to break this silence of leadership. We have to break on this uh, cycle of leadership. That is uh, most of the issues that we talk about, or we complain much, much about, but where the changes are uh, usually happening, young people are not there. For instance, most of the decisions I make at the National Assembly, young people must be committed to be at the National Assembly. They must be committed to be at the local government so that they can be, they have real powers to change the decisions and the, uh, in, in, in their own in their own way. More comments? Well, we have Daniel here saying that the person doesn't get a clue until they're in their late twenties, early thirties, and education has nothing to do with it. And we have a modern Jan on the blog who said that youth has nice have ideals but lack the life experience to understand how to bring their ideals into practice. I know that the youth, the youth that don't care, I don't think that everyone that does this, uh, that has this comportment doesn't care. I think that part of them, we here at Civic came because we are positive of the future, we think that we have a role to do, but people, some people, some youth, think, are, like, think negative, think that what, whatever we will do, think we will just continue to go bad, so why do Can you change their mind, Salma? Um, you can, if we, short answer. If we see that we, we, like if we show our positive, maybe we can. Okay, positive note there to end on. You've been listening to World Have Your Say from the Civicus Youth Assembly in Montreal. Woo!